Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with a 24 hour reading vlog. So I'm going to be doing the timer method this time around. I'm just going to start a timer on my iPad and we will count down from 24 hours because I don't intend to ever do a 24 hour readathon in one sitting. I don't even think I'm capable of a 24 and 48 where I split it into 12 hour periods over the weekend. I just don't even think I'm capable of that. But I am starting this on one of the hottest days of the year. It's going to be, I think, 97 and feel like 110. We love that for us. So it seems like an ideal weekend to just stay in and read. So I'm getting this started pretty late though. So I doubt I'll finish this all this weekend. It probably will spill over into next week. But I thought I would just go on and do an introductory portion so I could tell you my TBR. I don't think I have much going on over the next couple of days. So this is probably an ideal time. I have ordered some bookshelves for pickup from Target. So I'm really excited about those so that I can finally get my bookshelf area in order in my bedroom. But other than that, I did a lot of pre-filming yesterday. So I think today should be pretty open. So I wanted to just tell you my TBR. This is so ambitious. Not all of this is getting done, but these are just books that I'm pulled towards right now. On my Kindle, I have Our Hideous Progeny which is a retelling of Frankenstein. I don't know that it's actually a retelling. I think this has been marketed more as a sequel. And I just wanted to have a book on the Kindle just in case. I think I read faster on the Kindle, frankly. I don't know if that's true, but that's always been the way it seemed to me. But this is historical fiction. It's about Frankenstein. And I think this is kind of focusing in on the discovery of dinosaur bones which just seems like a whole lot of fun to me. So I'm really excited. Option number two is The Tartar Step by Dino Buzzati. This is an Italian classic uh, that is a modern classic. And I'll be frank with you, I don't know that much about this one. I just really wanted to pick this up because it seemed relatively short. And I really wanted something that I thought I could tackle in a 24 hour period that would be a classic. This was really the only thing on my shelves that I thought could be read in a 24 hour period, frankly. So we'll see, but this one is kind of an option. Another option is the book that I am currently reading, which is Good Girl, Bad Blood. This is the sequel to A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, which I read in July. And you know, I just thought it was okay. And really, so far, the second book has also just been okay. I really was contemplating this morning. Literally, I've been planning this 24-hour readathon for a while. And I honestly contemplated this morning not doing it just because this is the book that I'm currently reading, which is a shame to say because I would think a thriller is kind of ideal for this. It's going to move very quickly. But these are just okay books to me. I don't think they're that fantastic. But this is the book that I'm currently reading, so I guess I should prioritize it. We also have Clytemnestra, which is a Greek myth retelling. And this is one that haunts me at night because I fully intended to get to this the day that I got it. And for some odd reason, I have just never gotten around to this one. I don't know why. So I really would like to get to this in this reading vlog. This is going to be, I think, my top priority of the TBR. Last but not least is The Beast That Is War and Peace. I'm getting ready to start this. I thought it might be kind of motivational to start it during a 24 hour readathon. I wanted to maybe do an entire vlog around this book, but I think I'm going to need to get my momentum up first. So I might start this in this 24 hour reading vlog, but I don't know how far I will get. But that is my current TBR. Who's to say that something else won't come in and take over? Uh, and who's to say that I'll finish any of these? We really don't know. I'm so chaotic. But right now, these are all the books that I am currently feeling. So I'm going to get reading.
I'm about an hour in, so not that far. And I promised myself I wouldn't update until we were farther in. But I am about a quarter of the way through our hideous progeny. I just decided to start on the Kindle. And this is so good so far. It feels very much like straightforward historical fiction. It is a sequel to Frankenstein. And there's a hint at the very beginning that it's going to go into the same thematic content as Frankenstein. But so far, this has basically been about the science of the Victorian period and specifically the discovery of dinosaurs fossils, which I just think is fascinating. I really love just the conversation that's ongoing about fossils because I guess to me, I didn't really realize what all was going on in the Victorian period in terms of paleontology. There's been a lot of discussion in this so far that the Crystal Palace is about to open up, which is one of the most fascinating things about Victorian England to me. I love the Crystal Palace. And there were these really famous dinosaur sculptures that were done for the opening of the Crystal Palace that are apparently just incredibly inaccurate. And in this book anyway, it's discussed as though people knew at the time that these were inaccurate statues, but really nobody cares because this is about the public coming to see the dinosaurs. So I wonder if kind of the Frankenstein element is going to be that they're going to resurrect a dinosaur. I don't know. I'm really enjoying it so far. It's very interesting. I think they're clearly making the main character and her husband. This is about uh, our main character, Mary Frankenstein, and her husband, and they're both kind of in the paleontology world. They are really making them mimic Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley. I feel really bad because I feel like every single version of Percy Shelley that I read is just a genuinely unlikable character, and I actually think this guy's rather charming. But I can see that we're supposed to be really critiquing him. We're not supposed to really like him at all. But I kind of enjoy him and I can see what they're trying to do. I think really the author is trying to make us think of Percy Shelley and Mary Shelley here because there's elements of their pasts that are discussed. In the opening chapter, you learn that they have lost a child, that this really devastated her and he coped in a very different way and essentially left her to grieve by herself. That is very famously what happened with Percy and Mary Shelley. So I'm really excited by this. I just think this is really good. I have really enjoyed a lot of new releases this year, kind of in the historical fiction, literary fiction realm. And I think this is interesting because it's also trying to like interact with horror. So I think this is gonna be fun and it's kind of making me want to reread Frankenstein. But so far I am doing pretty well. We are officially about five hours into the readathon. You may can tell from my haggard appearance and by the subpar lighting that it is now nighttime. Uh, so Saturday, did not get a full 12 hours of reading done. I really did kind of want to split this over two days, but I can sense that this is going to go into the week. But I did wind up going to Target. They fulfilled my uh, pickup order to get my bookshelves. So they did that really rapidly. I was really scared. A lot of times when I order on Target's app, they'll tell me they don't actually have something in store and I have to order it online. I was really worried about this because these shelves were apparently not available to be shipped online. So this was just luck of the draw, frankly. So of course I went to Target and then of course I had to go into Target. I wound up with a cute new swimsuit cover up in a roundabout way I just lost hours of the afternoon, frankly. But this evening I got back to it and I have since finished our Hideous Progeny. I basically read this in two sittings. I updated you the first time and now I'm updating you now when I'm finished. And I personally think I would have read it this fast without the motivation of the 24-hour readathon. I really just think it had something compulsive to it that I really enjoyed. It's hard because clearly the book wants you to compare it to Frankenstein. And I think if we're going to do that, this book comes up short in many different ways. You can definitely see where this book was trying to interact with the themes of Frankenstein and specifically the idea of playing God. And I thought that was interesting. It was certainly like a more modern take on that idea, which was a bit more like, this is something we're owed. We're allowed to experiment with something like this, which I think is odd given that to me, the tone of Frankenstein is definitely that no one should do this. Of course, now here in the modern day, we have AI, we have robots. So in a way, people have created life 
artificial life, but they've created it. So I think the conversation around that should have adapted. And so it was interesting to see this done with the Victorian period in particular. I think the Frankenstein elements of this though were not the parts of it that I really enjoyed the most. I just thought it was an enjoyable historical fiction, frankly. The last line of the author's note at the end though, it, it kind of got me choked up. It kind of got me. It kind of spoke to me on a deep level. And I think it spoke to just those of us who love Mary Shelley and who love horror, who love women in horror. And I think what was really interesting about this book was just how blatant it was in its discussion of topics. I think sometimes that is something that's really, really hard to do well because a lot of times if it feels heavy handed, people will critique you for it. And I think rightly. And I've moved on to another book that I think is being very heavy handed in a way that I don't enjoy. But this to me was interesting because I thought it was so clearly discussing these topics and these issues. It meant that no matter what, if you were reading this book, you were engaging with what the author wanted you to talk about. And I thought that was really smart. And it's also something that was there in subtext of Frankenstein, which is just kind of the absence of great female characters. The absence of women in the narrative, I think makes for an interesting discussion point. I found the main character really, really fascinating and I just absolutely loved her. She said everything I wanted her to say. It was very therapeutic to read her actually. And her husband was one of the most frustrating characters I've read in a really long time because on the one hand, I kind of liked him. And I guess that was like the defensive part of me that wants to always be on Percy Shelley's side. I felt like there was something Percy about him. And I just wanted, I just wanted to be there for him. I wanted him to have a supporter, but he kept doing stuff that irritated me to death. Absolutely irritated me to death. I loved this though. I loved the writing of it particularly because I felt like it really transported me to the Victorian era. It was just wonderful historical fiction. I highly recommend it as historical fiction. I don't personally think it skews into horror too much the way that I think Frankenstein does. Frankenstein really goes there. Frankenstein's scary, <laughs> but I didn't really feel like any of this was. I didn't even feel like the ideas were that horrifying to be talked about because Frankenstein framed the entire conversation around what's going on as very horrifying, even before you met the supernatural elements, even before the creature is really something to be scared of it framed the entire discussion of what Dr. Frankenstein wanted to do as something horrifying. And to me in this book, it was framed as just scientific exploration, just the natural next step. And that can be horrifying in its own way. And I think it's interesting because the Victorian period is just so different from the Romantic period or the Regency period because the rapid scientific changes that were going on then are just tenfold in the Victorian period. It's really fascinating. I loved this. I gave it four stars. Part of me wanted to give it five, but there were just parts of it where I thought this could have been better or I could have felt more emotionally engaged in it. But gosh, it was absolutely fascinating. I love Frankenstein. And you know, in some ways, I think I love Frankenstein because it has inspired things like this. It has inspired a lot of conversation. And I think that's really interesting. So the first book of the read -a -thon, absolute success. I then got my act together. I started putting together my ideas uh, for annotating War and Peace, which I think was important. I think it counts. I think it needed to be done. I read the first chapter of that. And then I wanted to fall down the Napoleon rabbit hole because they mentioned him on page one and I wanted to refresh myself on things that had been going on with Napoleon. So I did not get very far into that. So I thought I would go on and start the book that I'm also the most excited about, the one on my TBR that has really intrigued me the most and is one that I feel like I just really want to get off of my TBR. And that is Clytemnestra by Costanza Cassati. And this is the book I was referring to. I think this is very blatant in its discussion of Clytemnestra as just a character in Greek myth, what she wants, kind of the storyline that she has and the ideals that she embodies. And I think that's gonna be present in any retelling of her story. Clytemnestra is the wife of Agamemnon uh, who went off to fight with the Greeks. He was the leader of the Greeks in the Trojan War. 
and hers is essentially a story of revenge. I'm nowhere near the most interesting part of Clytemnestra's story, of course, but to me, this is just a little bit heavy-handed in the topics that it wants to talk about. Like, literally, in every single chapter so far, we have had mentions of the fact that Clytemnestra likes power, that Clytemnestra is attracted to power, and now that Agamemnon has come around, she kind of doesn't like him, and everyone's like, well, you don't like him because he also likes power. And I'm thinking, how many times can we say this? I get it. <laughs> I get it. And I'm probably walking into this maybe with more knowledge, I guess, than the average reader, because I'll read any retelling of Clytemnestra. And maybe all of these references have been put in there for someone who doesn't know anything about her. But for someone who does, I think this is very heavy handed. And it's in a way that I don't like. I really praised Our Hideous Progeny for doing it because I thought it was interesting that it made you engage with the themes. But this to me is kind of the theme that all of these recent Greek myth retellings have had, which is that the women were wronged. And of course, that's really true. Uh, and that women are allowed to be wrong, which is definitely true. I support women's rights, but I also support women's wrongs. That's why I love her. She is actually my favorite Greek myth heroine now. I really am fascinated by her. My favorite used to be Electra, who was actually Clytemnestra's daughter. And I really think the switch happened for me when I was reading last year. I was reading Electra by Jennifer Saint. And I noticed that I felt just far more towards Clytemnestra than I did towards Electra. And it's interesting because as a teen, I really connected with Electra, and Electra is such a teenager. Like that's definitely who she's gonna connect with. She is a child, she's trapped in childhood. But Clytemnestra is a woman. And I think the older I've gotten, the more I sympathize with what she goes through and the more I really support her. <laughs> you know, go there girl, I'm gonna clap for you. I know that maybe others thought she was a villain, particularly you have to think, particularly when you were analyzing this from the perspective of a classical society, people probably did not view her positively as well. But for me, for me, she is a queen in all ways. I support her. Do what you have to do, girl. I adore her. I adore her and I think of everyone, she deserves a retelling like this that reframes her narrative in a really great feminist sense because you know what? <laughs> I mean, really, her story kind of is a feminist story and it's kind of how a woman has to work in a man's world subtly. And then when she's bold, when she does the thing that a man would do, she is uh, ridiculed for it. And I just think she's really fascinating. And I guess maybe I'm being hard on this because she is my favorite character from myth. So I'm gonna try to like let go of things. I'm gonna get to the most interesting part of her life and just see how I feel from there. But I was kind of feeling about 50 pages in that I probably was not gonna finish this, which is sad to say, this is one of my most anticipated releases of the year. So I'm going to keep going with this tonight and we'll see how far I get. Quick update, it's Sunday now, it's now Sunday afternoon. <laughs> and so uh, I plan on reading a lot this afternoon, but I did read a little bit more this morning in Clytemnestra and also in Good Girl, Bad Blood. And Clytemnestra has at least gotten interesting. I think it's at least trying to do something different. I think the issue that I'm having with it is certainly the writing style, that's remained true. But the one thing that I wanna say about it now is just kind of the way it has interpreted the myth of Clytemnestra. And I think this is always an interesting discussion to have when you're talking about a retelling of any kind, but specifically a Greek myth retelling. There are so many different versions of the myth out there, even in the ancient sources, that you're kind of open to doing what you want. And really, I don't think many people can say you've done it the wrong way because there are so many different iterations of the myth out there. But I think what she's chosen to do is interesting. And I think her interpretation of events has been at least thought provoking so far. So that's a positive. It's one of the few times I have seen Clytemnestra kind of automatically dislike Agamemnon. Often they kind of do like each other or she at least is intrigued by him and she kind of wants to marry him often in a lot of these myth retellings and then she later kind of figures out what he's all about. And in this one, I feel like she's going in with no blinders. She knows exactly who he is and she doesn't like him. So I think that's interesting and that means 
means that this is at least going to have some interesting commentary moving forward. So I'm still going to carry on with it. I was debating last night, should I DNF this one? But I'm definitely going to carry on with it. I still have 17 hours left in the readathon. So even if I feel like this slows my momentum down, I don't necessarily think it's going to put me into a slump. There are other books on my TBR that I'm really excited about, but I think this one is picking up pace the more I read it. Good Girl Bad Blood is so interesting. I wish I had brought it down here, but I just feel like this trilogy, A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, it's very lackluster to me. I feel like it's very middle of the road. It's just so truly a two and a half, three star read. And this book is no exception. And what I'll say is that I think when this series gets to the point, like when we're actually exploring the mystery, that's when I think the series is really great. That's when I think the book's really engaging. But I feel like all the other things we're getting just in general, like the meat, the characterization of Pip, the main character, that is the stuff that slows it down and I think is really unneeded. This is a YA series though, and I wanna say it definitely feels marketed towards YA audiences because this is just so unbelievable. Like honestly, the whole time I am reading this series, I'm thinking to myself, where are your parents? And then when her parents get involved, they actually approve of what she's doing, acting as an amateur detective. And I'm like, are you, <laughs> are you okay? Are you okay? Because definitely dangerous things have happened. But this is about a missing persons case. And I think what's interesting is that truly the mysteries are very well thought out. The first book I didn't see coming. In this one, I don't even really feel like I know what's going on, which has been very fun. But I feel like everything else, like just in general, the characters maybe, not for me. The writing is maybe also not for me. But I think it's at least an interesting mystery. And I do think it's great to have a mystery series that is YA, that actually does feel targeted towards teenagers. So that's kind of where I'm at today. I might mix things up a bit. I feel like while I'm giving my brain a break, while it is still the weekend, now would be a pretty good time to start reading in on War and Peace, but we will see. We are officially halfway into the readathon. We are over 12 hours in. I thought I would wait until now to give another update because I feel like I've been updating far too much. I finished two things and I would say, sadly enough, both of these things were disappointments to me. The main one is Clytemnestra. I know in the last clip, I feel like I was talking about how much better this had gotten, that this really did pick up once it got into the more interesting phases of Clytemnestra's life. I wanna say that the book really did try to do some interesting things. It tried to make some interesting commentary on her story, but it just wasn't for me. 100% this book was not for me. And it got to the point basically where every feeling that I had about the book was negative. I feel like I tried to give it the benefit of the doubt and I wanted it to be so much better than it was. And so I let myself get kind of excited about it, but I really did not like the writing style. This truly did feel like a debut novel to me in terms of the prose level. I felt like it was very heavy handed in terms of theme, which just kind of bothered me. And just in general, I would say it's not a great retelling. And I have been waiting to make a Greek retelling video until I read this because I felt so sure this was going to be my new favorite. And this has to be one of my biggest disappointments of the year, sadly enough. I really just did not vibe with this in any way, shape, or form. I really didn't like it, and I feel like it's kind of hard to say why because I don't really know that I have a great justification for it. There was just so much about it that rubbed me the wrong way, uh, particularly just the amount of times we had to see assault on the page, basically. I think it can be conveyed to us that someone is bad and that a man is bad and that this is a man's world, that this is the patriarchy. I think that can be conveyed to us in a way where we don't have to have essay in basically every chapter, where basically every woman we meet has had to endure that. And that is not me saying that that's not authentic to the original myth, because I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's there in subtext and I can see why Costanza Cassati wanted to go there. But to me, it just was way too much of it. And I think it played into just in general, the themes being very heavy handed and very, very blatantly on the page. It's interesting to talk about that and critique that when I loved another book in this vlog for that particular reason. But this was just so massively disappointing to me. It was just a real shame. This kind of made me want to put the readathon 
on hold for a little bit, but I decided that I should probably finish another book that I was in the middle of. In fact, the book that I probably should have started the whole 24-hour readathon with. And that is Good Girl, Bad Blood, which is the second book in the Good Girl's Guide to Murder series. I know I said initially when I included this on my TBR that I wasn't feeling that excited about it just because to me, this is very basic. This is very run of the mill. And it just remained true. I think in truth, my feelings on this are that this probably should not have been a series. I don't even know that it should have been interconnected between characters. It's not like the mystery went from book one into book two and then into book three. It's to me that I really, I guess, don't like any of the characters. I don't like the town. I don't like anybody. <laughs> and so I really don't enjoy the thought of spending another book with them solving a mystery. I also feel like these are very basic in terms of plot, but I just wanna celebrate the fact that to me, the mystery elements are extremely well done. I think a lot of the time I'm reading this constantly wondering like, where are your parents? You're a teenager and your parents are allowing you to do this. And so I have to try to tell myself this is a YA book. And for someone in the YA age range, this is probably exactly what they want to hear. This is exactly what they think. And I mean, in many ways, it just feels very, I think, kind of Pretty Little Liars. And I really enjoyed the Pretty Little Liars when they came out or when the show was on because I was in that age range. I was a young teen watching that show. And so to me, that was kind of valid. And so if I turn my brain back to YA, Jenny, then I can really see what this is going for and I can enjoy it. This was kind of disappointing to me. It was a three-star read and really in the end, I enjoyed it far more than I did Clytemnestra. That's 100% true. I enjoyed it so much more than Clytemnestra. So I guess I'll finish out this trilogy. I don't know that I will do it in this 24-hour readathon, though I guess that would be kind of an easy win because these are really, really quick reads. And I think I probably should not have read through this series immediately. I don't think I probably should have moved into this second book so soon because thrillers really work well for me when I'm trying to get out of a reading slump. And when I'm not in one, I just don't know necessarily that they are my genre. So I finished both of these. War and Peace, I'm maybe on page 50. It is taking a long time for me to get into it. It's just taken a lot out of me because it is 100% a desk book. It's not a book that I can move around the house. I can't sit with it in my lap. And you may say, Jenny, why didn't you just get the ebook version? Because, okay, because I am 110% about the aesthetic. I really wanted to annotate it. And I think annotation is what has slowed me down thus far. And I posted a video about different translations of War and Peace a couple of weeks ago, probably when you're seeing this. And I got a couple of comments about the annotation process and just how in general that probably slows down the reading. And for me with War and Peace, my thing is, I think I will probably read it in total because I've certainly tried it before but I think I will probably read it in total only one time in my life. And I really just want to give that one time my all. And I think if I'm annotating, I am enjoying the process a little bit more and I'm getting more out of it because 100% Tolstoy's writing is not for me. I can tell you that at page 50, he's too direct. Sometimes I want to wonder, and I guess that's my thing about Clytemnestra too. Sometimes I want to interpret things on my own. <laughs> you don't need to hold my hand. That really frustrated me about War and Peace when I DNF'd it back in 2021. I thought, I don't need you to hold my hand. You don't need to explain everything so blatantly to me. The characters are also super hateful in War and Peace. I had forgotten about that. I think that was some of my struggle. I said, there's nobody here to root for. You know, there's no one likable. Uh, and so I hope that people go through some character changes because I remember loving Prince Andre in the miniseries. In this, he has to be one of the rudest individuals that I've ever come across in literature. But I do think I'll move forward with that. I think the motivation of a 24-hour readathon is great for a book of that size because it means that I kind of can take my time with reading it. So you never know, maybe I'll read more in that tonight. But I decided that I think my next book will be the other book that was on my TBR, The Tartar Step by Dino Buzzati. This is an Italian classic, a modern Italian classic. It was published, I think, 1939 or 1940, so right on the cusp of World War II. And this is about a soldier who is stationed at a fort where 
basically nothing happens. He's constantly waiting for the war to come. He's waiting for military glory. He's waiting for just something interesting to occur that I think is never going to come. I've always had apprehensions about this book in particular, even though it comes highly recommended from most of my Italian subscribers. I have really had apprehensions about this because I don't like things that are absurd or pointless or like about the concept of nothingness, which it seems like a lot of books written in the 30s, 40s, and 50s were really focusing on. That is just so nihilistic to me. And I think y'all can probably tell, though I'm pretty much a realist in how I'm going to talk to you, I'm very direct. Uh, I am an idealist in kind of my philosophy. I have a lot of hope. I have a lot of optimism. And so stuff like this rubs me the wrong way a little bit, but I think this is gonna be interesting, as most classics are to me, for the historical context. I think it's gonna be interesting to read something written about a war on the cusp of World War II, uh, because World War I in Italy is kind of an interesting thing. And the introduction of this made mention of one of the big campaigns in Italy in World War I, which was up near the Dolomites. And so that's kind of why the setting of this book is in the mountains. I am 20 pages in. I just started this and I thought, let's go on and move this off the TBR because I was looking at other books on my TBR, trying to think what I should pick up next. And I thought, well, I guess I really should give this one a go because I named it in my TBR clip. So I am apprehensive about this, but let's give it a go. Believe it or not, we have made it to the end of the 24-hour readathon. Uh, it's Tuesday now, so I did do this over four days, but I think that was pretty great. I often don't read that much during the week, so I think it was pretty awesome to have the motivation and have something there that was really compelling me to pick up something during the work week. The big daddy, the big beast that I think I have spent the majority of the time on has been War and Peace. And a lot of that has just been due to the fact that I've been annotating. And you may say from the annotations that I haven't read very much of this, you would kind of be right. I'm somewhere around the 100 page mark, but chapters come and go in this that really nothing interesting happens. And I don't mean that like it's boring, but nothing happens that I feel like is what I'm trying to take note of in my annotations. One thing I'll say, I do have a color for dislikes, and I feel like at this point, even early on, I have more dislikes than I have things that I truly loved or quotes that I'm pulling out. I do think this is gonna be a hard journey for me, and I think probably in the end, I should have just listened to myself because in all honesty, I don't know that this is going to be even a four-star read. I think this is just gonna be okay for me. But I think in the end, I'm just going to feel so proud that I accomplished this, that I read it. I think that's probably really just the high I'm going to chase the whole time. It's a real shame. But I can already tell, even here at 100 pages in, that this is probably just not going to be an all-time favorite for me. And that's okay. Every book isn't. But I've struggled with Tolstoy in the past, and I should have just listened to myself, I think. I really thought I had the capability to absolutely love it in this translation. And I know I'm not even at the point of the book where we're really at war, and I know that's going to be of more interest to me. It was the time before when I was trying to read it, and I wound up DNFing it. To me, the parts that are about the war are far more interesting, because I'll be real with y'all, I'm reading this because I like Napoleon. I'm interested in seeing the scenes with Napoleon. So we're not at the point where I'm going to be really invested in it, let's just say, but I don't know. I feel bad because I feel like every time you critique something that somebody thinks is a classic, I get so many people in my comments like, you don't understand it. I do, okay? You're allowed not to like things, but it does make me fearful every time I want to give like a big massive classic a negative review. But this one does not have me yet. And now it's 100 pages in. The book is clearly like 1,500 pages. So I don't feel like I can even judge it that much. But so far, I just really thought at this point I would care about at least one of the characters, but I sure don't. But the last book that I fully read in this readathon 
is an absolute success. I'm really glad. I feel like we had some ups and downs throughout this 24 hour period and some of the books that I picked were just not bangers. And this is one I was worried about when I gave y'all my last update last night. This is one that I was really worried that I wasn't going to like. And that is the Tartar Step, which as you can see, I tabbed up. This was absolutely incredible. I am sorry that I said that I was apprehensive about it. I fully intended to update in the middle of this, but it was only like 250 pages. It was kind of the ideal book to be reading during a readathon. And yes, this did go absurd. Yes, it really talked about absurdity. And frankly, absurd was a word that was used on nearly every page of the text. And so you could definitely see that was one of the themes that the author was playing with. But to me, it was done really well. And it was done in such a way that I really, really loved it. I think this book was honestly profound. I feel like that's really talking it up. That's really giving it a whole lot of praise. But honestly, I really did. I felt like you could read this book on multiple different levels. And one of the levels was kind of like the death of youth and moving from childhood into adulthood. And that was certainly talked about at length in multiple passages in this book, which I think made it just absolutely wonderful. I picked this up thinking that I might get a Herman Hesse vibe from it, that I might get a Demian vibe from it, which is one of my favorite books. And it was there. It just most certainly was not on the level of the writing of Herman Hesse and Demian. But I did think this was beautifully written. I thought it said a lot of interesting things. I mean, my gosh, I just was really moved by it, frankly. And one of the best qualities of this book to me was just the way that it instilled dread in me as the reader. I thought that was really fun. It gave this like a very horror vibe, a very spooky vibe, which I really liked because they're at this fort where nothing is happening and they essentially feel like they've been sent up here to do nothing. And so all of the soldiers kind of start seeing things in the distance and hoping basically that it is the enemy, hoping that a war is coming so that they will feel like there was a point to them being there. And so this leads into like a little bit of surrealism or even magical realism where men think they are seeing things that aren't there. And I think that really created a lot of dread in me. It was actually really scary sometimes to like think if you were there what would happen to you and the discussion of the book is like do these men believe something is out there do they really believe something is coming or is this a coping mechanism for being put basically at the end of the world genuinely genuinely fascinating honestly if you were in school and you wanted to write an essay about something i feel like there were at least 10 different topics that i pulled out of this <laughs> and all of them were really different lenses to view this story through which I think really makes the book a very dynamic read. I am sorry that I came into it with low expectations, though maybe that really helped me in the reading process, but I essentially read it in two sittings last night. Like I took a break for dinner and that was it. And I just absolutely loved this. It took me longer to read than I think it normally would have because I was annotating it. But oh my gosh, like it was just stunning. The quotes in here, gorgeous. I gave this four stars. Part of me was like, does this deserve five? but there is nothing for you on a character level here. This is all about concept. And I'm trying to rate books on enjoyment. I'm really trying to rate books on things that I think I'm gonna to continue to think about. And for me, that is normally the characters. I often rate books five stars for the writing, but they're not books that I think about ever again. And so I'm trying to stop doing that. And I think that has put me at a disadvantage with most classics because I realize that the reason I'm reading them is for the pros and I get nothing out of them on the character level nine times out of 10. That was certainly the case here. This was all about concept. And you can make the argument the character is not important to a narrative like this whatsoever. And I would say it definitely isn't. That's not the point of this book. Our main character, Giovanni, is basically an everyman. But I still think I would have wanted a little bit more out of it in terms of either writing or concepts in order to rate this the true five stars. So it got four stars from me. It was an absolute delight. And I'm really thankful to those of y'all that recommended this to me. Thank you for joining me on this 24 hour reading vlog. I would love to know down below if you have read any of these and I would love to know too, uh, if you have been doing anything like a 24 hour readathon, do you ever set a timer during your reading? I think that's really interesting and I think it's really motivating, but that is going to be all for me today. So I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.